independent in thought, and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. And my name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. You can jump in at 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD, or at thechadshow.com. Lots of ways for you to be a part of the broadcast. And President Trump and Melania go to Iraq. And the media has gone nuts over this. And it depends, of course, which media you're watching. But it, even the Wall Street Journal had to point out, and they're not big Trump fans, but even the Wall Street Journal had to point out the constant spin zone. It said President Trump and his wife Melania made a surprise visit to American soldiers in Iraq Wednesday. You would think that would be a straightforward event to write up. Report how he arrived, whom he visited, what had some of the soldiers said. Because remember, this is supposed to be a news article, right? Not opinion, news article. You can write whatever you want the opinion. News article. I mean, this is something that presidents have been doing now for the past few presidencies because we've got troops overseas. They go visit at some time during the Christmas season. So first, the media was all over Trump for this president hasn't gone. He's the first president that hasn't gone to troops in Christmas time. And of course, while they were reporting it, he was en route. <laughs> so he gets there. Well, he finally arrived. And then some were even saying, you know, we didn't like what he said, so he shouldn't have gone at all. So it went from he should have gone to he's there, but who cares, to he shouldn't have gone in about a couple hours. So even the Wall Street Journal is pointing this out. And they look at the first two paragraphs from the Washington Post story. Now, remember, this is a news story, not an opinion story. This is the news story. You ready? Quote. President Trump touched down Wednesday in Iraq in his first visit to a conflict zone as commander in chief a week after announcing a victory over the Islamic State that his own Pentagon and State Department days earlier said remained incomplete. The president's visit to Al-Assad Air Base west of Baghdad, which was shrouded in secrecy, follows months of public pressure for him to spend troops deployed to conflicts in the Middle East and punctuates the biggest week of turmoil the Pentagon has faced during his presidency. I mean, that's a lot of negative stuff about that trip in the first two paragraphs of the Washington Post news article. I mean, could you imagine them writing it that way about Obama? No, of course you can't, because it wouldn't have happened. The Journal, back to them. These reporters can't even begin a news account of a presidential visit to a military base without working in a compilation of Trump's controversies, contradictions, and failings. And the point isn't to feel sorry for Trump, whose rhetorical attacks on the press have often been contemptible. The point is that such gratuitously negative reporting undermines the credibility of the press without Trump having to say a word. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're making his point for him, and they keep getting worse. And we'll get into some of the details that I got some audio of it here in just a second. But he did go the day after Christmas, and there were a lot of troops there who seemed genuinely enthusiastic that the commander-in-chief had taken time to come see them and the first lady the day after Christmas. And here's, here's the question, because a lot of people have been giving President Trump a lot of grief about pulling out of Syria. Isn't that what he ran on? I mean, didn't he run on saying we're not going to be the world's policemen? We're not going to do the nation building. We're, we're going to try and get out of these places. Same kind of thing President Obama said. Same types of things that at one time George W. Bush had said. But we continue to do it. We never got all the way out of Afghanistan with President Obama. We, we never really got all the way out of Iraq with President Obama. And so now here's President Trump and we're still in there and we're still in Syria and we're still in Afghanistan. It's like, OK, wh when do any of these things end? And so I've heard a lot of Democrats and Republicans. Normally, the Democrats will be all for getting us out of there. But since Trump did it, it's horrible. But a lot of the Republicans who would always say, hey, let's stay because we got to make sure that we're keeping America safe. The problem is they can't answer questions like this. What really is the ongoing mission in Syria? Well, it's to keep ISIS in check and it's to make sure that Iran doesn't take over. OK, isn't that what we've been doing for the last how many years now? Oh, uh, well, but we can't stop. Why? Well, because if we do, it'll totally unravel. And if we stay there, how long do we stay? Well, we don't know. we got to stay till the job's done. How do we know when the job's done? I mean, how do we know when the mission is accomplished? The biggest question really should be this. Okay, when you look at what we went in there to do, and you look at how much we have accomplished, let me ask you this. 
would you send your son right now to Syria to fight, to risk his life for what's going on in Syria? And if the answer is no, then why do you want us still to be there? I mean, really, that should be the defining thing. for If you think it's enough that you would go fight or you would want your son or daughter to go fight, then I'm with you. But if you don't, then why would you send someone else? 844-DIG-CHAT gets you in on that. 844-DIG-CHAT. Okay, so let's get into a little bit of President Trump. Some of his talk here about saying, hey, look, we're getting out of here. We're going to do it the right way. But people have deserved to come home at some point, And we're not going to be the suckers of the world anymore. Let's start with cut four, the very first one here. President Trump in Iraq speaking to our troops. Done. I made it clear from the beginning that our mission in Syria was to strip ISIS of its military strongholds. We're not nation building. Rebuilding Syria will require a political solution. And it's a solution that should be paid for by its very rich neighboring countries, not the United States. Let them pay for it. And they will. They will. Can anybody disagree with that? Is it up to us to rebuild Syria? Is it up to us to pour money, money, money in there? Is it up to us to continue to have American lives at risk there? And if you say yes to that, then tell me, how do we know when it's done? And how do we know when it's time to end it? Trump goes on here. Next cut, cut five. Our presence in Syria was not open-ended and was never intended to be permanent. Eight years ago, we went there for three months, and we never left. But now we're doing it right. Eight years ago, we went in supposedly for three months. I, You know, math is not my favorite subject. I thought you said there'd be no math. But I think eight years is more than three months. A lot more. So I just keep asking. The people that are mad, I've seen, you know, uh, Marco Rubio, big mistake. Lynn Cheney, big mistake. I've seen people saying it's a big mistake. Well, that what what is the answer then? Of getting out of these quagmires all around the world. When do we do that? When do we know we won? You can't say we're just going to stay in all these places forever, especially when you're somebody who never has to go. At some point, they need to stop. And President Trump is saying, now's the time to start doing this. Cut six, please. One year ago, I gave our generals six more months in Syria. I said, go ahead, get them. And it turns out it was really a year and a half ago. I said, go get them. We need six months. Go get them. And they said, give us another six months. I said, go get them. Then they said, go. Can we have one more, like, period of six months? I said, nope. Nope. I said, I gave you a lot of six months, and now we're doing it a different way. And we're doing it, and you're doing it, folks. That's a lot of time. I, I, I really, I mean, as the average person listening to this, don't you think the average person, that would include me, is saying, yeah, that makes sense. Three months turned into eight years. They said, give us six months. You gave it to them. They said, give us six months again. You gave it to them. What time does the six months stop? What time do we say that's enough? What time do we say that's the last person that needs to die for Syria? Well, they're not really dying for Syria. Or, or they're, they're dying for, because they're trying to fight ISIS, and we've got to stop ISIS. You've got to stop them over there before they come over here. Right. And, but they've greatly reduced ISIS. It's never going to be totally stamped out. So you just stay there forever? I mean, isn't that what we were told was wrong about being in Iraq? Isn't that what we were told is wrong about being in Afghanistan? The Democrats were all on board to get us out of there as quickly as possible because President Obama said so. Now, all of a sudden, it's the worst thing ever. It's your cut eight. The men and women who served our objective in Syria was always to retake the territory controlled by ISIS. Some people said we've already retaken 99 percent. That's a number that comes up a lot. But see, now it's mission creep. Now it's that, well, if you don't, Iran will sneak in there. If you don't, Erdogan will sneak in there. If you don't, but that's not why we went. And now all of a sudden, that's why we have to stay? Cut nine, please. There will be a strong, deliberate, and orderly withdrawal of U.S. forces 
from Syria, very deliberate, very orderly, while maintaining the U.S. presence in Iraq to prevent an ISIS resurgence and to protect U.S. interests, and also to always watch very closely over any potential reformation of ISIS, and also to watch over Iran. We'll be watching. Okay, so what does that mean? We'll be watching. Does that mean that we go back in if ISIS starts to grow again? Does that mean if Iran starts to move in, we go in and fight the Iranian troops? What does that mean exactly? I don't know. Uh, And I understand not wanting to tell the world, but that's where it gets really hairy. Okay, what if we get everybody out of there and it gets a lot worse? Do we go back in? Do we just drop bombs? Do we ignore it? Do we... What? I'm wide open to knowing what you think about this. And do you think President Trump is right or wrong about what's going on here in Syria? Also, what you think about his his trip to Iraq and the way the media, mainstream media, has responded so negatively to it. 844-DIG-CHAT. 844-DIG-CHAT. So a couple more here. Let's hear uh, cut 10 from President Trump. America shouldn't be doing the fighting for every nation on Earth. Not being reimbursed in many cases at all that makes sense i mean i think we're all a little bit tired of america being the world's policeman america always paying the freight america paying the majority for the un america paying the majority for nato america paying for everything not just in money but in soldiers and in lives and in injuries and in equipment and in everything And at some point, you know, you get to the point where you go, you know what, maybe that's enough. As Trump said, maybe it's time for us to stop being suckers, cut 11. If they want us to do the fighting, they also have to pay a price. And sometimes that's also a monetary price. So we're not the suckers of the world. We're no longer the suckers, folks. What do you think? 844-DIG-CHAD, get you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD. Is it time to do what President Trump is saying and get out of there? Or is it going to allow this to blow up and then what? But if you believe that now is not the time, then I need you to tell me how you know when it is. And I need you to tell me if you're willing to go fight for that or if you're willing to have your son or daughter go fight for that. And define what that is in Syria. 844 Dick Chad, get you on board. I also got some audio of how the media has treated this trip to Iraq and what some of the soldiers did as well. All that coming up. My name is Greg Knapp in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. Take one giant step to the left. Do you ever have anyone embarrass you like this? One giant step to the right. That's all that separates you from everything else that came from slime. You are now in the alt middle, where it's just right. Call if you get weird. This is the Chad Benson Show. If they want us to do the fighting, they also have to pay a price. And sometimes that's also a monetary price. So we're not the suckers of the world. We're no longer the suckers, folks. No longer the suckers, folks. What do you think? I I played you a lot of that to start today because the coverage that you've seen on this doesn't really let you hear what the content of President Trump's talk was. It's a lot of analysis of the president and why we like him or don't like him or this. But I just wanted you to hear what he was actually saying and his thought process behind the idea of saying this is it it's enough eight years supposed to be three months we've got to have an orderly withdrawal from syria we we can't be the world's policeman we can't pay all the freight we can't keep risking our young men and women's lives and there has to be a time when it's over do you agree with that or do you think no it's a big mistake i'd love to know that 844 dig chad 844 dig chad get you on board my name is greg knapp filling in for chad on the chad benson show sarah sanders put up a story here through Twitter, she said a member of the United States Army actually came up and told President Trump that he came back into the military because of the president. And President Trump responded, and I'm here because of you. Sanders said, I met him afterwards, and he gave me the patch from his arm. And she has a picture of that. She said, incredible. 
And there were videos of the troops warmly responding to him. But some of them even had President Trump sign hats, Make America Great Again hats. Oh, man, CNN did not like that. Oh, man, they were upset about that. How dare they? They're not supposed to do Was the president making this a campaign stop? Did he bring hat? No, the actually, the troops had their own hats that they were bringing up and just wanted to sign it. Well, it's not supposed to be a campaign stop. So you're telling me if President Obama had signed an Obama shirt, that CNN would have been mad? What's the president supposed to do? No, I can't sign that hat for you. No, no, no CNN might get mad. I, what? Speaking of CNN, yes. Oh, these were the guys that were all over Trump for not going, and then when he went, he went too late, and then they didn't like what he said. So <laughs> we've got a, a little montage here that was put together. I think Newsbusters put this together. And... So there's two little parts to this I wanted to start with. It's a mashup of the CNN coverage on President Trump going to Iraq. Let's hear cut one on that. So the trip marks the president's first visit to a war zone as president and comes less than a week after he ordered a complete withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria. It was his first uh, trip overseas to visit troops in a combat zone. The unannounced trip coming days after Mr. Trump's controversial decision to withdraw forces from Afghanistan and Syria. Uh-huh. The First Lady, there are those who have commented on social media about the sunglasses. I will tell you, having been bleary-eyed from some flights before myself, you do what it takes, right? I pass no judgment on that. No, no none at all. That well, we'll whatsoever. talk about it. Yeah, she was wearing sunglasses at night when she came back. I wear my sunglasses at night. So, remember that hit? So, yeah, she wore sunglasses, but we're not going to point pass any judgment, but we're going to talk about it because maybe something was wrong. Maybe the president hit her in the eye. Maybe she's covering up a shiner. I, we're not going to pass any judgment. Greg, they didn't say that. No, I know, but nobody thought that. That wasn't what they were trying to. I mean, are you kidding? Uh, there's more. Uh, we just got it started. I mean, there's, there's, there's stuff from Don Lemon. There's stuff. We'll get you all of that. Your comments on the trip, on his pulling us out of Syria, whether you think it's right or wrong or not. And then what overparenting is doing for the next generation. Oh, you're going to hear this one. Greg Knapp in for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. And my name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. 844 Dig Chad, get you on board. 844 Dig Chad, and you're in. We're talking about President Trump's visit to Iraq. We had a, a member of the military said, I got back in the Army because of you. He said, No, I'm here because of you. He said, It's time to bring him home. It was supposed to be three months. It was eight years in Syria. Tried to explain we're not going to be suckers of the world anymore. Other people have to pay, not just America. We gave the general six months to take care of business. They say, Give us another six months. We did. Finally, we said, That's enough. Do you agree or not? And if you disagree, tell me, when do you know it's done? And when do you say that's it? When do you say mission accomplished? Do you ever? Because it seems like we don't in place after place after place. And so, of course, the the media, the mainstream media, the reason that when Trump attacks the media, it resonates with his base and really beyond his base. Is because you can see just how biased they are against this guy. We read you the beginning of the Washington Post piece. There was a little bit from CNN. Well, here's a little bit more. The second part of that CNN montage of them going into President Trump's trip to Iraq. Here we go. There's an important step, albeit one that took a long time for him to do. For after two years in presidency, visiting soldiers uh, in, in Iraq. Uh, this was kind of over the edge. The other thing is over the, the commentary. Do you think, did the president, from what we know, get a good sense of what the situation actually is there on the ground. Well, I don't know how you can after three hours, but that's just me. I I forgive the sunglasses, by the way. This entire trip we should look at uh, from 
our perspective when we cover this man is it's just another flash over substance type of thing of everything with this president is staged events it seems very disingenuous it seems so contrived and so disingenuous he should have made it earlier he only made it because mattis quit and he had a lot of pressure saying he hadn't gone anywhere if you put it in the larger context of what's going on it does seem disingenuous So it's disingenuous. It was just to change the topic. Uh, It's all photo op. Milani wore sunglasses. Wow. Look, I've been consistent. When President Obama went overseas to visit our troops, I didn't rip him for doing that. When President Clinton goes over, when when Bush did it, a president should go overseas and visit the troops. Of course it's staged. Everything presidents do are staged events every single one of them (laughs) of course they are and especially because of the security that is needed but the troops seemed awfully happy to have the commander-in-chief take some time to do that but not according to don lemon no according to don lemon on wednesday cnn tonight trump was the grinch who stole christmas let's hear cut three please it really was perplexing when you when uh, watching his message today and then yesterday i do have to tell you I mean, I tried not to because it's with my family. When we right. turned on CNN and we saw um, the president politicizing a Christmas message, huh? it, was very, it was like we kept saying, he's like the Grinch. Instead of, I'm being honest. No, he stole Christmas. Being, being instead of being Christmas. positive yeah. with the troops, saying mm-hmm. this is about the troops, it's not about me. I'm here to thank you for your service, whatever. Even if reporters ask him questions, this is not about me. This is about the troops. They serve our country well. Maybe he said it's unfortunate that some of them are not getting paid, and I wish they were. And we'll come to an agreement and make sure that everyone gets paid, the 42,000 um, members of the Coast Guard who are not getting paid. So let's, you know, let's be positive about Christmas. Same thing during Christmas. This thing, it was so negative and so yeah. you want to. You want positivity when it comes to Christmas. It is perplexing. Why would he visit the troops and do that? Well, Don, to be He's candid, I hope that this trip hope from a, help from a morale perspective. But from a national security perspective, for all the reasons that you just listed, the president should have stayed home. Oh, should have stayed home. Vinograd, that's what she went on to say. This trip was about Trump trying ostensibly to score political points and to list his accomplishments instead of telling troops that what they're doing matters and clearly outlining a mission for them going forward. Did, did she hear everything we just played that he was saying, yes, you guys took care of them. You guys reduce ISIS. You guys reduce the territory that they covered. You guys are doing a great job and we're going to bring you home. No, that wasn't it. And, and you just, you know, he was just so negative. He was answering the reporters questions about the shutdown, which, by the way, if Obama had done, Don Lemon would have said it's a good thing he used that time to tell people. what was. I mean, at some point, you just got to say enough. And I think that's why when President Trump goes after the media, people understand. It. All right. 844-DIG-CHAT. Get you on board. 844-DIG-CHAT. I want to totally shift gears on you. I'll still take calls on that for you if you want. But I saw this today and it resonated with me. Jonathan Haidt is a social scientist. Greg Lukanoff and he wrote a book together. Here's the title of the book. The Coddling of the American Mind. How good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. This book is all about how parenting has changed. And and their their premise here is that around the mid 1990s Parents stopped letting their children have tons of unsupervised play outside and started hovering over them and started making sure that everything was safe and that the kids were watched. And what it's doing is it's leading to generations of children growing up not knowing how to be independent, not knowing how to take care of difficult circumstances, not knowing how to handle teasing, bullying, harassment, and expecting some kind of an adult authority to save them every time their will feel wings all hurt. I couldn't agree more. Think back to your childhood, because the first thing this made me think of was my childhood, the independence and freedom that I had. And I can remember my childhood fairly vividly because we moved a lot so every place we used to live i can remember that area so i remember those events and first i was in pontiac michigan until i was four years old and i remember before we moved i was riding up and down that street on my big wheel and then my bicycle with no adults around it's four years old 
uh, I mean, you know, a couple miles each way on the street with the neighbor kids. No big deal. It's just what you did. And we'd be playing outside all the time by ourselves. Pick up games all over the place. Little kickball, little dodgeball. And then I remember it moved upstate New York till I was nine, from age four to nine. And that's when I really got my independence because we lived in a neighborhood that was still being constructed and my dad was in construction. So there were all these forests out behind our house and there was a lumber lumber salvage area where they were just throwing away all the pieces of wood that they couldn't use until it got hauled away. So my brother and I especially, we'd just grab all this wood and we'd haul it out into the woods and we'd build tree forts literally 30, 40 feet up in the trees. And we'd, we'd hang out in those tree forts. And we, we built them all throughout the forest, all by ourselves. We're up 30, 40, 50 feet. There's no safety equipment. There's no. We're eight and nine years old. And it was cold in the back in the forest. There'd be these little ponds and creeks that would freeze over, and we'd go skating on there. <gasps> we might fall in. There were no security rails or little floating devices. You just took it. It was just fun, man. Come home from school, dump my backpack in the front part of my house and say, Mom, I'm going out to play. And you had to be in by the time the sun went down. That was it. And yes, there were bullies. Yes, there was teasing. Yes, there were fights. And you know what? You figured out how to work it out. And you figured out how to move on and have fun again. Sometimes with the same bullies. You know, you get in a fight with a bully enough and you stand up for yourself. And next thing you know, you guys are friends. No, no, we can't have that. No, no, no. You learned how to handle this stuff. And bike rides? Oh, man. When I learned how to ride the big boy bike, I would go with my buddies for like, literally five or six miles away from the house. I remember I'm nine years old by the time we moved. So it had to be when I was under nine years old. My parents had no idea where we were. There were no cell phones. There was no way to get in contact. And it was awesome. We played kill the man with the ball. Remember that game? Can't say that anymore. Kill the man. Kill the person with the ball. Well, we can't say kill. Harm the, no, um, tackle. Maybe we could say tackle. I don't know. Maybe tackle's too intense and too violent. But we played kill the man with the ball. And it was awesome. And we played King of the Rock. There was this huge rock. Had to be eight feet tall. And it was just big circular rock. And whoever climbed up there, then everybody else tried to climb up there and get on. And you get pushed down. And yeah, sometimes you bounce off the rock. We had King of the Hill. Because like I said, it was a construction area. So there were these big dirt mounds that were like 20 feet high. And you'd run up to the top of that and try and knock each other off. This is all great childhood fun. Can you imagine parents letting you do that now? I mean, if, if somebody found me as a nine-year-old um, five miles from my house on my bicycle, my parents have no idea where I am. Nowadays, they'd probably report it to the Children Protective Services. Yes, this is absolutely accurate. The book by Haight and Lukanoff, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. About the mid-90s, parents got really worried about unsupervised play by their kids, and they started coddling them. And we're seeing the results. Why do you think we have these safe spaces in college? Why do you think every little slight is seen as something huge that, that needs some involvement from some source of authority? And what we're doing is giving away our independence, giving away our freedom giving away the chance to understand how to handle things as you get older. I mean, I remember a bully vividly when I was upstate New York. So uh, again, under nine years old, this guy bullied me every day in front of the bus, bullied me, bullied me, bullied me. And I was really getting tired of it. It was, it was winter time. It had been snowing a lot and I'm waiting at the bus stop. And all of a sudden I feel this snow slash ice ball hit me in the back of the head and go down the back of my jacket. And it was that bully. And man, I'd had enough. And you know, he was bigger than me. I knew I was going to lose the fight. But, you know, at some point, you just, you've had enough. And this is when I have to thank my mom for doing something she didn't even know that she did. And at first, I thought it was bad. You know, I wanted a brand new lunchbox, okay? I wanted a brand new lunchbox. And I wanted a cool lunchbox. You know, like one of those plastic ones that had the photo of the TV show you really liked, like the $6 million man or happy days or something like that. And so I wanted one of those. So for my birthday, my mom got me a lunchbox. She got me the construction man lunchbox. She got me the black metal 
construction worker lunchbox. That was it. Black metal. I'm like, oh, thanks, Mom. Because, you know, you don't tell your mom you didn't like it. It was a present. So I've got this black metal construction worker lunchbox in my hand full of my lunch in a thermos. And the kid just hit me with a snowball, ice ball, down my back. And, man, I just unloaded on that kid with my metal construction worker lunchbox. I mean, I hit him over and over and over as hard as I could as a little eight, nine-year-old. And the bully never bothered me again. Sometimes you just got to take control of this. But instead, now we give them safe spaces because, Greg, violence is never the answer. What was the answer there? Sure seemed to be the answer with Hitler. Sure seems to be the answer sometimes. Because just talking to somebody who's bullying you all the time doesn't work. And then we end up thinking that somebody else is going to come rescue us. How many of our kids that we've raised now expect somebody to come to the rescue? Somebody's going to come save them. Don't like your job? Somebody will come rescue you. Right? Somebody's being mean to you? Don't worry. Someone will come rescue you. You don't have to do anything. You should just sit back and wait for the government to fix it. That's how we're getting what we've got. How do we fix that? Do, do you feel like, can you remember back in your childhood, the things you did that there's no way kid would be allowed to do now? And do you think it's helping us or hurting us? 844-DIG-CHAD gets you in on that one. 844-DIG-CHAD. And I got a great story for you. Wait till you hear what a major league baseball player did with his signing bonus. Coming up in just a second. 844-DIG-CHAD. My name's Greg Knapp. In for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. Serving up talk radio medium rare and dripping with irony. It's Chad Benson. And my name is Greg Knapp. Filling in for Chad. You can jump in at 844-DIG-CHAD or thechadshow.com. Love to know whether you think this book is right, that we're coddling our minds now. And in the mid-90s, parents stopped letting kids play unsupervised as much as they used to and became coddlers. And now we're raising kids who aren't as independent, who aren't as strong, really, who aren't able to handle offenses and slights. And so they demand safe spaces and somebody to come rescue them and save them. Can you can you relate from what you did as a child to what you allow your kid to do? I know I can, big time. Okay, great story. Brady Singer is a first-round draft pick in the Major League Baseball draft this year. He's now prospect for the Casey Royals, and the USA Today is reporting on what he did with his signing bonus. He said, to give back to the two people who have given up everything to support my brother and I, I can't thank them enough. And he put up a video clip online. It showed his parents opening a letter from him. So there's absolutely no way I could have done all this by myself. Both of you constantly took off work and spent every dime you made just to put a smile on my face. Then he talked about all the money they spent on traveling, the gear, hotel, food, all the Gatorades I drank, everything they did to help him become the baseball player he is so that he could be a first-round draft pick out of the University of Florida, by the way. Go Gators! And he's now considered the top prospect for the Royals by Baseball America. Well, his signing bonus was $4.5 million. So what he put in this video was the big reveal is that he was going to use some of that money to totally wipe out his parents' bank loan and all of their debt. He said, now instead of trying to save money every weekend to replace the savings account you drained on traveling to see me play baseball, you can spend it on yourselves because you deserve the very best. Wow. All right, so it doesn't say exactly how much he had to pay off for the house and the cars and everything else and replenish their savings account. But that's pretty awesome to have your son do that. Now, here, here's the thing, if you ask me, is that he didn't owe his parents anything. I know as a parent, I, I, I don't feel like my, my daughters owe me anything for everything that I've done for them and my wife have done for them. And so a part of me was saying, all right, would you let your son do that for you? Would you let your son take some of that bonus money 
and pay off all your debts. I mean, it was your choice to sacrifice for him. It's his money. He doesn't owe you anything. See, I don't think our kids owe us anything. We chose to have the kids. We owe our kids. Our kids don't owe us anything. Now, if they want to do nice things, that's great. And that led me to the second thought. If I had a son or a daughter who who became rich like this, who really wanted to do something nice for me like this, and they had plenty of money like this, then wouldn't it be wrong to tell them, no, I don't want your money? I mean, if he wants to do this, if he wants to give to you, and he gets joy out of giving to you, and it makes him feel great that he... It's like the NFL and NBA players that buy their parents' homes. Or they buy him new cars. Because I'm, I'm a little bit torn on it. Do you want to have your kid do that for you? Because they don't owe you anything. Or is it, hey, they want to do this. If it's them wanting to do it and it brings them joy and they feel great about helping you, then yeah, I would say sure. But they certainly shouldn't feel like they owe you. Or, or, or they shouldn't feel guilty for what you did for them. Because that's what parents are supposed to do. My name is Greg Knapp, in for Chad Benson, 844-DIG-CHAD to get you on board. This is the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. in thoughts and punk rock in life it's the chad benson show hey how you doing my name is greg knapp i'm in for chad on the chad benson show 844 dig chad get you on board the program 844 dig chad the chad show.com online i hope you had just a very very merry christmas and depending on what religion you are a member of or whether you're an atheist or whatever i just hope you had a great time i know Many Christians, well, I guess all Christians, believe that Christmas is the birth of Jesus Christ. So the reason I bring that up is because Ocasio-Cortez, the representative-elect of New York, is trying to use Christianity to push her message of open borders. Now, she'll say she's not for open borders. She'll say she's for homeland security. She'll say she's for secure borders, but... Then she says everybody should be let in. Everybody. And so she's trying to use the story of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph to say if you are against actually having borders, then you are against Jesus. (laughs) She tweeted this out on Christmas. Joy to the world! Merry Christmas, everyone! Here's to a holiday filled with happiness, family, and love for all people. I'm with her 100%. I'm like, that's a great tweet. And then she finishes it up with including refugee babies in mangers and their parents. See, Jesus was a refugee baby. And the parents were refugee parents. And, okay, okay. first of all, that reference is to Christmas night in Bethlehem, right? So she's saying there were refugees in Bethlehem? No. Let's at least go, before we even get to the whole idea that, If Jesus was a refugee, then we should all let all refugees in because otherwise we hate Jesus. But let's start with how wrong it is historically to say that the baby Jesus in the manger in Bethlehem with his parents were refugees. No, they were called to Bethlehem by the government. They weren't refugees. They were doing what they were asked to do. The census was to go to your home uh, city and nation. So they went to Bethlehem, the city of David because that's where Joseph was from, in order to be counted. That's by the government. They weren't breaking the law. They were adhering to the law. They weren't fleeing anyone. They were doing what the government asked them to do. By the way, nowhere does Jesus or the Bible say there should be no nations or no borders or no immigration laws. In fact, it says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Plus, In the United States, we do grant asylum if you qualify for it and you legally, 
We have legal ports of entry where you can claim asylum and we can see if you qualify. Real claims of asylum get granted. People with real threats against their lives. But if you notice from this caravan, the people who are being interviewed, it's all about economics. It's not about asylum. And the ones who truly are looking for asylum, why didn't they stop at the countries along the way to the United States of America? Either southward or northward. I mean, if you weren't coming to America and you were going south, there are plenty of countries you could claim asylum for. And by the way, are you telling me that every place in your country is so dangerous that no one can live there? Then how are people living there? I mean, it gets a little bit crazy here. What this really is is about open borders. And that's what they want. And so they're trying to play on your religion to get you to think that that's what Jesus would want you to do. Jesus would want you to say, there are no borders. Everybody can come in. The problem with that is, what would that do to our country? You realize there are hundreds of millions of people around the planet who would love to come to the United States of America to live. We have 320 million. We've already got somewhere between 12 and 20 million illegal aliens. We take in uh, close to 2 million a year from all around the world legally. How, how many? You know, Americans donate $410 billion the last year, $410 billion to charities. And we can do that because we're a very rich nation. You destroy this economy, where is that money going to come from? So first of all, she's totally wrong on the idea that Jesus was a refugee baby in Bethlehem. And that's what her first tweet was. But then we move on to where they're saying, well, what she really is talking about is when Mary and Joseph had to flee Herod in order to save Jesus' life because King Herod had talked about, you know, we're going to kill all the, all the babies because he wanted to make sure that Jesus was dead. So many on social media said, no, 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 no. That's, that's not true. One was Father Frank Pavone, director of Priests for Life, tweeted out this. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, in her Christmas tweet, mistakenly called Jesus in the manger a refugee. But if she meant his family fleeing from the murderous threats of Herod, that is more akin to the Democrats pushing for abortion than to anything at real Donald Trump does. Oh, see, the Democrats don't want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about what Jesus' opinion on abortion would be. <laughs> no, no, no. We don't want to follow everything Jesus says. We just want to make it seem like Jesus was a refugee so that you will have to accept anybody who ever makes it to the United States of America and just throw out all of our immigration laws. Derek Hunter, Daily Caller, said, Mary and Joseph weren't refugees, moron. They were on their way to pay their taxes as mandated by Rome. You're now Rome, by the way. True. Uh, but here's the other thing. And it, it was a great piece here by Taylor Millard over at uh, Hot Air saying Jesus' flight from Herod is not the same thing as refugees fleeing war. Jesus, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary's flight was to escape King Herod's decree for the death of all newborns. They crossed from Judea into Egypt. Here's the problem. Neither Judea nor Egypt were independent kingdoms. At the time, they were both provinces of the Roman Empire. Egypt was under direct Roman control. A prefect served as governor. Now, Judea was a little bit different. King Herod had some autonomy in Judea, but was still under Roman rule as a client king. In fact, Flavius Josephus wrote of Herod's subservience to Rome in his tome, The War of the Jews of the Destruction of Jerusalem. So, look, Herod had to adhere to what Caesar wanted that's why the census was ordered and even had to request permission to punish his own sons now he had some autonomy but his power came from rome and he had to do what caesar wished the 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 flight from judea to egypt would be like you fleeing from texas to oklahoma or new york to connecticut or florida to georgia or it was more like going from one state to another because they were all under the Roman Empire and there was no law being violated to do that. Nice try, though, Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, these are the people who are claim that President Trump politicizes things. They're trying to politicize Christmas. They're trying to politicize Jesus on the run from Herod. They're trying to compare that to actually enforcing our immigration laws. And there are people who buy it. 
I don't. Sometimes I'm like, what? What is going on? How, how can people buy this stuff? How can they really believe it? Oh, and also, Cortez put out a second tweet. She superimposed religious halos on the heads of an illegal alien family trying to come in. This is what it looks like. This is what they're trying to do. And she, she, she wrote this. True love is radical because it requires us to see ourselves in all people. Otherwise, it isn't love. And yeah, I, I absolutely agree. We need to have love for all. I don't hate anyone trying to come into this country illegally. Not at all. I'm a first generation American. I totally get one to come here. But my parents, my mom and my aunt and my grandma came in legally by the law. And they had a sponsor and they never cost the government any money. They never went on welfare. They never went to HUD housing. They never did because you're not supposed to do that when you come here as an immigrant. Because we got enough poor people. <gasps> How dare you saying we shouldn't take poor people in? What happened to give us your tired and your poor, those yearning to be free? Well, those people had to make it on their own. There was no Medicare, Medicaid, welfare, food stamps. There was none of that stuff when that poem was written for the Statue of Liberty. But now there is. And by the way, there were still rules to come in. A lot of people were sent away as they were coming into Ellis Island. They were turned around and sent back home. And a lot of people who came and couldn't make it went back home. Because you can't take everybody. You can't take in so many people. And it's such a socioeconomic situation that it destroys what you have and harms the people that the American government is supposed to protect first and foremost, which is the American citizen. Second, the people who are legal residents. But certainly not for people who really have no right to be here at all. Well, then what, don't you care about those people? Absolutely I care about those people, which is why we try to do everything we can to help them, which is why we have $410 billion that Americans donate to charity every year. And we've got how many Americans that go on mission trips and how many Americans that do volunteer work and how many Americans who try as hard as they can to help people all around the planet. But you... You have to have some kind of law, don't you? Not according to Ocasio-Cortez, because if you think that we should actually enforce our immigration law, that, by the way, these laws were bipartisan laws, and not too long ago, Bill Clinton and Barack Ob well, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were saying the same things that I'm saying. Not very long ago at all. But if you say that now today, that means you hate Jesus. Oh, plus, you know, we're killing these migrants. Yeah. Another migrant child died in our custody at Christmas Eve. See, we don't even care about it. We want him to die. Is this what you want for the Trump administration? Well, as you get more details about it, the father of that Guatemalan child who died Christmas Eve, that child had already received treatment in a hospital, had received medication. Both the father and the child together were put in a temporary holding facility. The agents there checked on the child, gave him his medication. But a few hours after they got there, the child complained of being nauseous, vomited. They came to help him. The father denied, declined further medical treatment for his son. Told the officials, no, oh, my son's been feeling better. They checked him again later, said this kid needs to go to the hospital. He lost consciousness during transit, eventually declared dead. Just before midnight it's horrible it's a second child that has died in custody but do people really think that anyone in our border patrol anyone in in immigration and customs enforcement any of these doctors any of these nurses want these children to die can you really believe that they see these people face to face they want to help these people this is why they signed up they're there to help the people and enforce our BP, Border Patrol and ICE are there to help the people and enforce our laws. The doctors and nurses are just there to help the people. I don't want them to die. In fact, it led to what the uh, Department of Homeland Security is calling for to help these children and these refugees. I'm going to get to that in just a second. Love your phone calls on it. It's 844-DIG-CHAT. 844-DIG-CHAT gets you in. My name's Greg Knapp. This is the Chad Benson Show. State. 
Beats? Uh, no. Deep Doodle? Yeah. The Chad Benson Show. My name is Greg Knapp in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. You can jump in as well at 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD. Hope you had a fantastic Christmas. Looking forward to the new year. It's a great time, the week in between. Just so much fun stuff to do. Uh, probably have to work a day or two, maybe. Hopefully you have more time off, and I wish you all the best. We were talking about what's going on with so many of the so-called social justice warriors. and They've been doing this for the last few years. Now Ocasio-Cortez is jumping in, trying to make it seem like Baby Jesus was a refugee in the manger in Bethlehem. No, he was called by the government for a census so that his dad could pay taxes. What are you talking about? Well, then King Herod, with the with the decree to kill all the newborns, they had to flee. There, there they were refugees. See, they had to go from Judea to Egypt. Well, both of those areas were under the rule of Rome, and both of those areas had to allow people to travel from one to the other. They weren't breaking any laws. Well, except the law to you know allow their kid to be killed. Maybe, as one priest said, they should care more about King Herod's decree to kill people and relate that more to abortion. But no, they don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. So then we got to what's going on with the refugees or the illegal aliens trying to get into the United States and some that are being caught. And held, and two children have died in custody. It's a horrible, tragic thing. But when you get down to the details of it, for this latest one, the father denied medical treatment after the child had had some medical treatment. And then when they finally che- when they checked on him again, and finally the father said, "Okay, you can start treating him again." It was too late. And the idea somehow that the nurses and doctors that are trying to help these children that somehow they don't care. That they want these kids to die? How can anybody really think that? That's just got hatred in your heart. That's got to be so much hatred for Trump in your heart that you want to blame everything on him and not even realize how much you're also blaming all the individuals involved who are there to try to help these people. Then we move into where the Department of Homeland Security says, hey, there's a problem here. We're seeing so many sick illegal aliens coming in, crossing the border from Mexico. And so they're calling on the CDC to investigate this and find out what's going on here. DHS official told the reporters literally dozens of sick illegal aliens are being transported to the hospitals across the border each day. Growing number of children showing illness. Quote, we're doing dozens of hospital trips every single day with children that have fevers or manifest other medical conditions. That's the Border Patrol Commissioner Kevin McLean telling CBS News. An official also told the reporters that DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen requesting that Mexican authorities also investigate the living conditions of the migrant holding camps across the border to see if that is the source of the illness. No, no, it's all it's Trump's fault. Trump's Trump's doing it. Trump's Trump's probably giving them smallpox blankets. That's what's go, that's what's going on. He's trying to kill them because he hates them so much. And the doctors and the nurses are in on it. And they're trying to make sure that no one gets any health care. I mean, it's insane. It is true insanity. 844-DIG-CHAD gets you onto the program. 844-DIG-CHAD. Love to know what you think about it as well. And, you know, last hour we were talking about just how crazy this whole coddling of our children has gone from the way we've been parenting around the mid-90s. We quit allowing kids to really go out and play unsupervised. And it's led to the coddling of our children and this idea of safe spaces and, and the college is trying to protect them. Well, a student has been asked to remove a sign. Wait till you hear why. It may surprise you. 844, Dig Chad, get you on board. My name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson on The Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. My name is Greg Knapp. 
I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. 844-DIG-CHAD, and you're on board. 844-DIG-CHAD online. It's thechadshow.com. I'm a, I'm a Will Ferrell fan. I, I like some of his movies. I like Talladega Nights. Uh, I, I like some of the movies he is in where he's not the guy who like wrote it and directed it and produced it and that kind of stuff. Uh, he's been in, I think, quite a few good movies. One was where he like had a garage sale out on his front yard. I thought that was really good. I can't remember the name of it. Another one where he's like Stranger Than Fiction, I think it was called. That was a good one. I thought he's been in a lot of pretty good movies. I saw the preview for this new one where he's Sherlock Holmes, Holmes and Watson. The guy that was in Talladega Nights is in this one with him. I saw the preview on YouTube because I was like, all right, let's see what Will Ferrell's got. I thought it looked like the dumbest movie I've ever seen. I said, all right, I won't be watching that one. It's just not my type of humor. It's got a 0% score on Rotten Tomatoes right now. They've never had that before. I mean, zero. People walking out of the movie. That's going to... That's got to really sting. I mean, this guy usually has some pretty big hit movies. I'm sure he got paid millions of dollars to make this thing. Zero percent. Greg, it doesn't sting that much. He's laughing all the way to the bank. I get that. But you put in the effort and the time and all the people who were in this movie, all the people who were working on it, all the money it took to make it, all the money it took to promote it, and it's got a zero. A zero. If anybody's seen it, I'd love to hear from you. 844-DIG-CHAT. And cause first of all, I want to know why you would go see that. I mean, if you if, don't you check the trailer out before you go? I mean, the trailer was like the worst I'd ever seen. But somebody still goes. It it, they, it made like sixty million this first weekend. Was it six million or sixty? Oh, sorry, um, six point four million so far. Six point four million. Mm, mm, that's that's a tragedy. All right, so I was talking about the safe spaces in college. Well, sometimes they can come back and bite you. The political correctness. An administrator at the University of Massachusetts Amherst has asked a student to remove a sign from her dorm room window because, he said, the sign interfered with the inclusive residential experience. Though the sign is permitted under freedom of speech, I would like to discuss the impact on the community that the sign has had. Residence Director Eddie Papazzoni emailed her. There are some in the community who have expressed that the sign should be taken down and it has created mixed emotions in the community on how to proceed, issues of inclusion, and the ability to be active members of their community. Well, what's the sign, Greg? What was that? What, I mean, what's going on here? The sign says F Nazis, except, of course, it's written out, rhymes with duck. So F Nazis. And the reason she said she put it up in the first place, Nicole Parsons is that someone drew a swastika on top of a Happy Hanukkah sign. And she thought the university wasn't doing enough about it. So she put her sign up. Oh, yeah? F Nazis. Now, I could see them saying, hey, you know, could you reword that? Because, you know, some people find it very offensive to have the F word out there in the dorm room, although they're in college, so I find that very hard to believe, too. But the point that I wanted to get to on this is this is where the chickens are coming home to roost. You start censoring people's speech because you call it hate speech. Then who decides what's hate speech and not? Is it hate speech to write F Nazis? Well, sure, she hates Nazis. So you have the right to hate people in this country. Now, it's wrong to hate people. It's wrong to to judge people based on skin color or or ethnicity or nation of origin or religion or what have you but you have the right to and it's it's really hard to find many people that are going to be upset that you say f nazis of course we're now living in an era where people are called nazis if they simply disagree with a liberal ideology i'm for tax cuts you're a nazi i'm for school vouchers to help kids get out of bad schools you're a nazi I actually think we should have borders around our country. Oh, you're a Nazi. I mean, everything's a Nazi now. So I don't know that it means very much, but this was for somebody who actually was a Nazi because they were putting swastikas up over the Hanukkah, happy Hanukkah sign. Now, unfortunately, we've also had fake hate crimes like this, if you call that a hate crime, where people have put up the 
the Nazi swastika on their own to make it seem like things are so bad on their campus and there's so many horrible, awful. We see it all the time. So I don't know exactly what happened, but the the residents email has now been eh, poo pooed by the higher ups at Amherst. Well, so here's here's what, how the email ended it said. While residence education cannot force you or your roommate to take the sign down, I am asking that you or your roommate take the sign down so that all students can be a part of an inclusive resident experience, as well as having a respectful environment to be a part of here on our campus. So it it sounds like the residence advisor is worried about the Nazi not feeling like he's included. (laughs) The chickens are coming home to roost. Oh, that's too funny. So now the university says, A poorly worded email from residents' life staff asking students to take down the sign does not reflect the values of the campus, and it should not have been sent. Amherst emphatically rejects Nazis and any other hate group of you expressed in the student sign. However, we are sensitive to the use of profanity, which some could find inappropriate. The university respects the student's right to display the sign, and it may remain up for now, you know. I, I love th- this is Catherine Timp brought it to my attention, National Review, and she points out what reasons Robbie Swab said. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He says this incident highlights the coercive power of residence administrators who are the campus busybodies most directly involved in students lives. Although the university always maintained the student's right to leave the sign on her window if she wanted that she was asked to remove it is the perfect example of why I've always warned against the compulsion to make laws against, quote, hate speech end quote. See, to many liberals, it seems as though such a ban would only result in the elimination of speech they don't like. But that's not the case. It's true the same rules by which you seek to silence others might one day be used to silence you. Yeah, see, the whole point of the First Amendment is that it makes it legal for people to say things you don't like and to write things you don't like. Because if it was just for things you like, then you don't need the First Amendment. The whole point of it is people get to say things that jack you up. People get to say things that you don't like. People get to say offensive things. Yes, people even get to say hateful things. And you have the right to say things back or to ignore them or to try to debate them or to try to change their mind. You don't force it underground because you think you have cornered the market on what is hate speech and what isn't hate speech. And you get to shut people up. That's what Antifa's trying to do. That's why they're the true fascists calling everybody else a fascist. And it's just one more example of it happening in Amherst. Well, it didn't really happen. They allowed her to do it. You know, they just talked about it. I mean, it's it's nothing, nothing to see. Move along, move along, move along. And we'll move along to the story of Reed Hoffman. You know who Reed Hoffman is? He's the co-founder of LinkedIn. He's a big-time Democrat donor. He donates to Democratic campaigns, to Democratic PACs. Just in the last election cycle, Fox News reporting, he donated $7 million to Democratic groups. And we don't know how much more to non-traditional groups because they don't have to report their funding. So we know he donates millions of dollars every election cycle to Democratic causes and Democratic groups and Democratic candidates. And one of the groups that he gave money to is called American Engagement Technologies. Now, that firm is run by former Obama appointee Mickey Dickerson. They got $750,000 from Reed Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn, the big Democratic donor, that was part of an effort to falsely portray the Republicans' Senate bid in Alabama, you remember him, Roy Moore, as being supported by Russia. Wait, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But no, no, the Russian collusion, that's all with President Trump. That has nothing to do with with the old Obama people and liberals. (laughs) Yeah, here's here's what they actually did. The money went through American Engagement Technologies, run by Obama's Mickey Dickerson. And they started this new United States digital service. The Democratic operatives created thousands of fake Russian accounts on Twitter. And had all of them follow Roy Moore when he was running for Senate in Alabama. So all the local and national media then said, hey, look at Russia backing Moore. Russia wants Moore to win. And it was all made up by the liberal Democrats here in the United States. 
They even created a Facebook page and imitated conservative Alabamians who weren't satisfied with the Republican candidate, encouraging others to write in another candidate's name. The New York Times spotted this first, and and they found this internal report that explained. It said, we orchestrated an elaborate false flag operation that planted the idea that the Moore campaign was amplified on social media by a Russian botnet. And it took credit for radicalizing Democrats with a Russian bot scandal after experimenting with many of the tactics now understood to have influenced the 2016 elections. So see, it's okay. See, this is what the Russians did in 2016, and that's why Trump was elected. Of course, there's never been any evidence whatsoever that the Russians changed one vote. Even President Obama said there's no way they could have hacked the election. There was no way this could have happened. Everything. That's why they didn't talk about it before the election. They didn't want you to think that the election was tainted at all. They were so sure Hillary was going to win. There was no reason to look at any of this. But now all of a sudden, that's why Trump won. So, hey, since that's why Trump won, obviously we should do that, too. Now, Roy Moore wasn't going to win anyway. He, he, you know, shot himself in the foot with all of his problems in his past. But they were so worried they decided to set up Russian botnets and make it seem like Russia supported this guy. So is this legal? This is okay? We got to go after Trump and, and all of his people and so far. Look at all the indictments he's had. Not one of them has anything to do with collusion with Russia, but that's okay. Look at all the things they found him to do. <laughs> but this, this, there's nothing wrong with this because we have to fight fire with fire, see? So Reed Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn, the big Democratic donor, $750,000 went to this organization that took part in this. He now says he's, he's sorry he didn't know. I find the tactics that have been recently reported highly disturbing. For that reason, I am embarrassed by my failure to track AET, the organization I did support, more diligently as it made its own decisions to perhaps fund projects I would reject. Perhaps? And perhaps. No, no, I want to be unequivocal. There's absolutely no place in our democracy for manipulating facts or using falsehoods to gain political advantage. Isn't that nice? I mean, now that it's all over. <laughs> oh, that, but that's different. That's different. You can't compare those two things. Come on. 844-DIG-CHAD gets you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD. Did you know there's been a big change in whether or not your child will be suspended from public school? And it's actually a good change. I'm going to get that to you in just a minute. My name is Greg Knapp, filling in for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. Set Chad straight. Text the show, 323-538-2423. That's 323-538-CHAD. Someone has to do it. Might as well be you. The Chad Benson Show. My name is Greg Knapp, in for Chad on The Chad Benson Show. There's a great piece in the Wall Street Journal. Jason Riley wrote it. Now, Jason Riley happens to be black, and the reason I point that out is because this column is about racial preferences in school and what Obama put in there. So Jason Riley has, you know, some cred in talking about this based on his experiences and the people he's interviewed and the fact that he happens to be a black man. And he says Obama's racial preferences made schools more dangerous. And now President Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos, is ending the policy. Uh Uh-oh. You know the, Demo- the Democrats and liberals are going to go nuts over this. But this is the policy. If you, haven't been, if you don't have kids in school or, or you're not a teacher or you don't know a teacher, you don't know just how crazy this has gotten, okay? And what, what started this with Jason Riley is he remembered an interview he had with a black man who said, I got my kid to a charter school not because I cared about the charter school but because his old school was so chaotic and there were so many fights I was called one day to pick up my son from the hospital because kids had jumped him in the sixth grade school bathroom. He said, I was just looking for an escape. So I got my kid out of there. And here's what happened. In 2014, the Obama administration sent school districts what they called guidance letters. And what they basically said was, you don't do what we say. The federal government will come down on you. They wanted black suspension rates reduced. They said, even if a school suspension policy, quote, is neutral on its face meaning that the policy itself does not mention race and is administrated in an even-handed manner. So even if you're doing everything right, the district can still be in trouble with the federal civil rights investigation if the policy has a disparate impact. In other words, 
if a disproportionate number of minority children are suspended, even if they did it in a gender, I mean, in a race neutral way, they could still face a federal civil rights investigation and lawsuit. So what they wanted was parity in school discipline, no matter what the behavior was. So what happened? It means schools decreased their discipline and decreased their suspensions. And guess what's happened? You've had an increase in problems. The administration demanded racial parity in school discipline, regardless of who is being disruptive, which would be the same thing as demanding racial parity in arrests by police, regardless of who's actually committing the crime. And it's had horrible consequences. In Oklahoma City, principals told teachers not to request a suspension unless there was blood. School districts in L.A. and Chicago softened their policies. Teachers reported more disorder. Students reported feeling less safe. In Philadelphia, truancy increased. Academic achievement fell. In Wisconsin, schools following the guidance saw reductions in math and reading proficiency. (laughs) Arne Duncan... It was Obama's education secretary said blacks are suspended at higher rates than other groups only because school officials are racially biased. It's not caused by differences in children, he said. Well, here's the problem. Many of these schools with the uneven discipline rates in the inner cities have minority principals and no shortage of minority teachers and administrators. Are they all racist? And by the way, this has hurt minority children the most. After New York City made it more difficult to remove troublemakers from the classroom, schools with the highest percentages of minority students were more likely to experience an increase in fighting, gang activity, and drug use. In fact, there was a federal report on school crime and safety. It found 25% of black students nationwide reported being bullied, the highest proportion of any racial or ethnic group. So... You're trying to act like everything's based on race, so you're doing away with the discipline you need to make sure that every child of every ethnicity gets a chance at an education without being bullied, without having all these problems, and surprise, you end up with more of it. Well, I'm glad they're re- they're, they're reversing this, and maybe, maybe they'll be able to get some order back in the classroom so that these kids can have a good chance at an education. Did you see Hillary's White House Christmas tweet, by the way? Did you see what Hillary tweeted out? I mean, it just never gets old with Hillary. Hillary tweeted out a photo, a Merry Christmas photo, from her time as First Lady with Bill and Chelsea in the White House in the first term, it looks like. So is she running again? Is this what this means? We can only hope. Oh, I would love to see her run again. Uh, I love to see. Is there any Democrat who wants her to run again? Have you seen the crowd she's not drawing at this big tour they're doing? Oh, Happy New Year to you. Merry Christmas. Glad I was with you. Um, My name's Greg Knapp. 844 Dig Chad gets you in. This is The Chad Benson Show. This is The Chad Benson Show. in thoughts and punk rock in life it's the chad benson show and my name is greg knapp i'm filling in for chad on the chad benson show you can go to the chad show.com you can call us at 844 dig chad there's lots of ways for you to be part of the broadcast hope you had a fantastic christmas i mean i just hope that it was amazing and it depends on what season of your life you're in on how your christmas goes right i mean if you're a kid it's amazing you can't wait to see what presents you get As you get older, it's different types of presents. As you get older than that, it's how you can help other people. When you have your kids, then it's all about seeing how your kids enjoy Christmas. Then as your kids get older, as mine are, now it's more about us relaxing together and and trying to come up with ways to help other people as well. And so I, I just want you to think about how great Christmas was for you. About the gifts that you gave and you received. But, of course, if you're older, you you really love giving a gift to someone, don't you? I mean, it really is pretty cool to see somebody's face light up because of the gift that you gave them. And and, um, nobody does that more than America in terms of giving. You know, I was just looking at this today because I was thinking about it. 
The latest study, the latest report that's called Giving USA, they look at this every year and see how much Americans donate to charity as a whole. So all the American individuals who are donating to charity, they add all that up. For, for the last year, this is the latest report that just came out, what do you think Americans gave away? Not to, not, to their, not to their friends and family, but to charities, overseas, domestically. What, maybe, I don't know, what, maybe, maybe a couple hundred million dollars? I mean, well, no, more than that. I mean, there's 320 million Americans. So, okay, a couple billion probably, right? 20 billion? No. Okay, 100 billion. That's a lot of money. No. 410 billion dollars that Americans took of their hard-earned money and voluntarily said, joyfully and voluntarily said, we're going to give this away because we care about other people. Because we love other people. Because we know that we're so blessed that we want to share this. Now, some of the people are atheists. Some of the people are religious. So for me, I'm Christian and and. I think all of us who give, give because we care about people. Then you throw in the religious aspect of it. For me as a Christian, it's because of God's love for me, and and he commands us to love one another and care for the least of these. And because of the love God shared for us, we have that love overflowing from us, and we've got to do it too. Uh, Other religions have similar belief systems. And whether you're religious or not, you're compassionate. If you're an American, 410 billion dollars to charity last year. Now, the reason I bring that up is to kind of premise the fact that after you just gave all the gifts for Christmas, after you've tithed to your church or given to charities or both, maybe you've done mission trips, maybe you volunteered, you've been giving your time, talent, and treasure to help other people because you care. Now you're about to be told by your government that you're going to be forced to give more. What? What are you talking about? You know what? And unfortunately, right now, some people are already falling for it. Here's what I'm talking about. Have you heard about the new Green Deal? This is what the Democrats are trying to push on us. And the leader of it, of course, Ocasio-Cortez, the woman who has an economics degree, but still thinks that unemployment is counted differently if people have more than one job. She has no clue how much so-called Medicare for all would cost, has no clue how to pay for it, and now she wants more. So she's pushing this thing called a Green New Deal that other Democrats are jumping on board with. And it's probably as... Michael Bastache over at the Daily Caller put it, the biggest expansion of government since the New Deal. That's why they're calling it the new, the Green New Deal. See, they want to build on the New Deal, which really was bad for our nation. When you start with the New Deal and, and, and continue from there to not just what was done at the New Deal, but then with LBJ, it, it goes from adding unbelievable debt to our country to truly breaking up families with the way the welfare system was set up. And every time we expand government, it seems to do more harm than good. So here we want to do it again, right? More than 40 Democrats are already on board supporting the Green New Deal. It sounds so nice. It makes us green. Who wouldn't want to be green? I mean, green is so trendy. Green is the way to... Save Mother Earth. I mean, who wouldn't want to be green? They should have called it the new puppy deal. I mean, who doesn't love a puppy? So, of course, instantly people come out, and there's a a poll by Yale's program on climate communication and George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication, and they say that 92% of Democrats and 64% of Republicans back to plan. Well, what is it? Well, we don't really know. (laughs) We, we We don't really know. We know a few things about it. We know that one of the goals in the plan is to move the United States to 100% green energy. That means no more gasoline, no more natural gas, no more coal. No, What? But that, that's what our nation depends on. Well, but we can't have that. 
We just got gas down to two dollars a gallon. What are you talking? We're a net exporter of oil now. We're a net exporter of natural gas. We're like the biggest energy creator on the planet. And you want to give that all away? Well, it's bad for the environment. It's going to this is much more important. Our water is cleaner than than it's been since the 1970s. Our air is cleaner than it's been to the 1970s. And we keep finding new ways to make it cleaner, even while we're burning this. By the way, did you know? Did you know? Even though we're not in the Paris Accords, the United States is the only one that's actually keeping the promises of cutting carbon emissions. We're generating more energy and decreasing our carbon emissions more than any of these countries that join the Paris Accord. In fact, the vast majority of them are not meeting their goals. And the ones who are, like China, set their goals so low that it was easy to make. France, England... All those guys? Nope, they're not meeting their goals. They're in the accord, and they're not doing it. We're out of the accord, and we are doing it. <laughs> it, just, it just keeps getting better. So they want to go to 100% green energy. Now, the problem is that most of these green energy companies are subsidized. So there's more of your money. And what about the people who are working in fossil fuels, and they lose their job? Well, we'll have federal job guarantees for them. How much is that going to cost? Oh, come on. Why are you worried about the cost? How come nobody asks about the cost when we have a new bomber? Well, we do. Oh, no, you don't. Uh, and also, guaranteed minimum income for everybody. That sounds great. Except all that will do is increase inflation and make people lazy. And universal health care, which, again, you, you know, Medicare for all. The problem with Medicare for all is Medicare's broke. All right, trillions in unfunded liabilities, and now they want to do it for this too. And by the way, taking the profit incentive out of medicine that everybody thinks sounds so great. There should be no profit in medicine. You should just do it because you love people. I want my doctor to get rich. Let me tell you why I want my doctor to get rich. Because when people can get rich doing something, it tends to make more people want to do it. And when more people want to do it, we tend to get better people doing it. And when you make more money, the better you are at it, you tend to work hard to get better at it, which is why we have some of the best doctors in the world in the United States of America. It's also how you make new drugs. It's also how you build new hospitals. It's Now, listen, I, I, I think there's a lot of things we can do to reform the way this profit is made. And to make sure that it's not the insurance company screwing everybody. Okay, I get all that. But to take the total profit motive out of it doesn't make any sense. We won't know how many new drugs were not invented. We won't know how many new surgical techniques were not invented. So you can't know things that didn't happen. Right? You can't know things that didn't happen. And you take the profit out and a lot of things that would have happened will not. And why Why would medicine be different than anything else? Even food. Think about all the advances we've made in food in terms of how many people we can feed now on such a little amount of acreage compared to what it used to be 20, 40, 50, 100 years ago. Because there's profit. And people end up doing better. Nothing has lifted more people out of poverty in the history of the planet than capitalism. We don't have real capitalism anymore. And unfortunately, the government gets way too involved in it because the check on greed and capitalism is the people quit using them. All right. So back to this whole new green deal thing. So 100 uh, percent green energy. Right. Which we know. Is not going to happen without a ton of subsidies. It's not dependable yet. You know, you know, the countries that depend on a lot of wind power, even they have limited the amount of wind power because when the wind doesn't blow, guess what? They don't have any energy. I mean, this is just nonsense. And yet we've got a majority of people in this poll, 92 percent of Democrats, 62 percent of Republicans saying, oh, that sounds good. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, I think we should get on that right away. Well, how much is this all going to cost? Well, it's hard to tell because the goals are so vague. But. The Libertarian Mercatus Center released a study in July on the whole idea of Medicare for all that Bernie Sanders and Ocasio-Cortez talk about. It said it will cost about $32.6 trillion over the next 10 years, in addition to what we're currently spending on health care. <laughs> oh, well, that's all. Then you have hedge fund manager Ray Dalio estimating the cost of taxpayers for a universal basic income policy, assuming each American got twelve grand a year, adult, 3.8 trillion a year for that. Oh, 
Eh, nice. I mean, I don't understand why we don't get on that right now. <laughs> uh, this is insane. And it's going to be forcibly taken from you if the Democrats get their way. You want to know exactly how much? Look, the money that this will cost is astronomical. And what it really does is move us very close to socialism. If you've got the government in control of all of healthcare, which is one sixth of the economy, if you've got the government in control of telling you what you can and can't do with energy, which is enormous. I mean, energy is the economy. Tell me what job you can do without energy. Tell me what you can do in your life without energy. I mean, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed, everything is energy. From your alarm clock going off. Oh, no, Greg, mine's a battery in my iPhone. Really? How do you charge that iPhone, huh? You plug it in. Well, I drive an electric car, totally 100% electric. Really? You plug it in at night, don't you? Where do you get that from? Probably a coal-fired power plant. But no, you're right. It's all renewable, 100%. Your business, whether it's a manufacturing business or a service-oriented business and business with a bunch of web servers. You know how much energy Google uses every day? But no, 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 this won't be a problem at all. This won't hurt our economy. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it because it's social justice, says the Green New Dealers. By the way, when you get that that whole idea of a guaranteed minimum income, you don't think inflation is going to go up with that? And negate a lot of what you got? Plus, where are you going to pay for it? You realize we're at $21 trillion in debt right now as a country. Eventually, something's going to happen with that. You know, you can't keep doing that forever. But I'm just getting started on the numbers. I want to tell you the numbers on this. We'll get into the whole idea of we're at the $2 gallon gas, which is just amazing. And this whole global warming thing, some interesting stories about tornadoes coming out fits into this nicely it's all coming up in just a second my name is greg knapp i'm in for chad benson 844 dig chad get you on board 844 dig chad this is the chad benson show you go boy this isn't about right or left this is just about right and wrong right you are chad the chad benson show And my name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on The Chad Benson Show. You can go to thechadshow.com online. You can go to Twitter and find them there. And you can dial us up at 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD, and you're in as well. So we're talking about this Green New Deal. Some are already calling the Green Raw Deal. Where they're trying to build on the New Deal and the Democratic Party. And that wasn't what history has been trying to tell you because of the way schools have been teaching it uh it really didn't help us with the great depression in fact many believe it made it worse cost us a ton of money and took us longer to get out of what we could have gotten out of earlier but okay they're building on that and they're calling it the green new deal the democrats wanted ocasio cortez pushing it 40 democrats jumping on it's really socialism so what we're talking about is trying to force all fossil fuel companies out of business 100 percent renewable energy All the fossil fuel jobs that we have in the United States. Oh, don't worry. We'll guarantee them a job. Really? How are you going to do that? And how are you going to pay for that? And we're going to have a guaranteed minimum income and universal health care. And it won't cost you a penny. Right. Okay. Right now, if you look at the cost of the Medicare for all and the guaranteed minimum income, If you put those plans together and what's been thrown out there, possible ideas and numbers, it would cost you, uh, Investor Business Daily found, about $7.1 trillion a year. Not not overall, a year. Do you know what our total federal spending was last year? Total federal spending, $4.2 trillion. So if we were going to put just these things in place, we're talking about increasing current levels of spending by 170 percent per year uh you think your taxes might go up for that are you kidding now they're talking about a carbon tax 25 dollars per ton of carbon uh that would be taxed at 1.1 trillion dollars would be the in- increase 25 dollars per ton carbon tax would equal 1.1 trillion per year guess what that's passed on to you 
You think these companies are just going to say, oh, well, I guess we're not making as much money this year. They've got to pass it on to you. So we'll destabilize our economy. We'll have inefficiencies in our economy. It will decrease the output we have every year. We'll have more problems with employment. We'll have more unfunded liabilities. Our debt will go even higher than it is now. Venezuela, anybody? Greece? Maybe Zimbabwe, North Korea, Cuba? I mean, would you like their economies? Sounds like a plan. Man, I hope people figure this out soon. I mean, the Senate's going to stop it right now. I mean, it's not going to go anywhere when, you know, the uh, Democrats take over the House. But it sure seems like we're drifting left, doesn't it? I mean, if we've already got a majority of Americans of both parties saying this sounds pretty cool, are they not keeping up? No, they're not. Because, they're, they're, listen, everybody wants to be an environmentalist. Everybody wants to sound like they're for social justice. So it sounds awesome until you look at what it really is. It's not social justice. It's stealing your money. It's taking away your freedom. It's not what America is. And it will destroy the economy. My name is Greg Knapp. In for Chad Benson. How about that $2 gas? We'll hit that in a second. Hang in. Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. And my name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad. I'm the Chad Benson Show. You can jump in at 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD, or go online, thechadshow.com. So we're talking about this new Green Deal. I don't know if you've been following it. Ocasio-Cortez and 40 Democrats jumped in. 100% green energy. We'll give guaranteed jobs to fossil fuel people put out of work. We'll do Medicare for all. And we'll do a universal income for all. You know, I mean, it won't cost anything except increase our spending by probably 170% a year. I mean, <laughs> $21.8 trillion debt right now. Oh, yeah, that's the latest. Terrence Jeffrey tracks this very closely. He's looking at the U.S. Treasury numbers, and he found that our federal debt is up $1.37 trillion since December 25th last year. That's 10000 $743 per household that was just added to our debt. <laughs> Think about that. What did you get for your $10,743 of debt that you added to the United States debt? Well, I mean, you didn't personally add it, but you're, you know, you're on the hook for it. We all are. Man, I got nothing. So we're at $21.8 trillion in debt now. But don't worry. It'll, we'll just print more money. Hey, crank the printer up. At some point, doesn't that hurt? Nah, no problem. Don't worry about it. Bond markets, what do they know? <laughs> so then we move to this whole idea of going away from fossil fuel. Remember when President Obama, during the last election cycle he was invo involved with, was, you know, you can't just drill your way out of this problem. You know, we can't drill our way to lower gas prices. And we were all talking about all the above. Drill, drill, just drill, baby. Remember that? No, you can't drill your way out of it. Well, we drilled our way down to a $2 gas price. According to the USA Today, about one in five gas stations in the United States right now charging less than $2 a gallon. I bought it for $1.99 the other day. I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is below $2. What is going on? $1.99. All right. And as many as eight states could soon have an average price under $2 a gallon. That's from GasBuddy.com. Holy cow. Now, you remember, we were told by President Obama, we couldn't get back to $2 a gallon gas. You know, that's not coming back. You no, know, we just can't drill our way to cheap gas, gas prices. And, of course, he did everything he could to try to stop it. I love how he, what was it, about a month ago, he tried to take credit for us being a, a oil exporter now. He goes, remember that start on my watch. You're welcome. A lot of people don't remember that, but you're welcome. What Here's what is the truth about it, President Obama, that you don't want to admit. He tried to stop drilling and fracking on federal lands. The reason we have more drilling under Obama, all of the increase under Obama, was on state lands and private lands. 
not federal lands. It actually decreased on federal lands. Google it, Obama. And he's trying to take credit for that. It's amazing. And the people who love him, that's right, that's right. That started under Obama. That's right. Hi. I mean, this is the guy that didn't want it. He, his, his people were talking about they wanted the price of gasoline to be like Europe. They wanted it to be 5 6 $7 a gallon gasoline because they thought that would make you drive less. I mean, sure, it's going to take more of your money, and it's going to really hurt your pocketbook. But, hey, you need to stop driving so much. If it really hurts you that bad, you should move into the city, which is what they want you to do anyway. They want us all to live in the cities and take the subway to work. And how dare you country bumpkins living out in the suburbs or out in the rural part of America that's really just flyover country anyway. I mean, sure, we need a few farmers out there. But the rest of you should live in the cities because we're tired of you driving those big pickup trucks. All right? That's what they think of you. And so he's, you know, we, we just can't drill our way to lower gas prices. Well, we kind of have. Just earlier this year, uh, again, this is IBD, the Democrats pounced on $3 a gallon. Chuck Schumer said this about the $3 gas price. President Trump's reckless decision to pull out of the Iran deal is why we have soaring gas prices. Something we know disproportionately hurts middle and lower income people. So where is Chuck Schumer? Anybody seen Chuck Schumer coming out praising Trump for the dollar ninety nine gap? No, you haven't seen it. Somebody get him on the phone. I'm sure it's just a matter of time. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. By the way, if you adjust for inflation, two bucks a gallon gas is as cheap as it's been all the way back to 1986. And I love this where IBD compares a gallon of gasoline to other liquids. A gallon of milk, average price in America. 261. Man, I wish I could get it for 261. I'm like around 325 for our milk. Oh, all right. Uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, that's what they say. Walmart, 24 pack of bottled water. You add it all up, it's about $3.14 a gallon. <laughs> so if you buy it out of the little, the little bottles, it's more expensive than your gasoline. How about a gallon of orange juice? $3.44 a gallon. Gallon of eggnog, seven bucks. Gallon of honey, $20. Uh, this is my favorite. Printer ink. Man, I hate buying the printer ink, don't you? A gallon of printer ink, $3,000. Wow. Uh, how about Chanel number no. five? <laughs> A gallon of Chanel number no. five, $10,000. But hey, we're mad that it's $2 a gallon gasoline. Now, one other point of this is how hard it is to get a gallon of gasoline to your car. I mean, look at everything that happens, all right? You got to find it. Now, that's exploration. That costs a lot of money. Then you got to get it out of the ground under miles of earth and rock. They use high-tech drilling technology. Then the, the, the ones that are recovered offshore and everything that goes into that, then you got to ship it, sometimes hundreds, thousands of miles to the refineries. There's only three main areas of the country where they are. From there, you got to distribute it by pipeline and truck to the gas stations across the country. Then it finally gets into your car. Oh, and by the way, the government adds about 30 cents in taxes to every gallon of your gasoline, depending on where you're living. And yet somehow still we get it for two dollars a gallon. That's the free market, baby. That's capitalism. Venezuela should be like that. Venezuela is sitting on some of the largest, if not the largest, known oil reserves in the world. And people can't drive their cars. They're sitting on fertile farmland that used to help feed much of South, South America. And now they can't seem to feed their own people. You want to know how bad it's getting? It's getting so bad that we're talking about three million people have fled the country now. Three million people have fled the horrific economy and the horrific human rights violations. And now starvation and sl sex slavery and gangs and killings. Washington Examiner reporting from Canada, to Australia, from Spain to Argentina, from Lebanon to Sweden, Venezuelans are not only emigrating in large numbers, but nowadays claiming asylum in 41 countries and the countries around venezuela 
are claiming it's causing a crisis in their country. What? Why would it be a crisis? I mean, anytime you bring new people in, it's a benefit for your country, right? I mean, isn't that what we're told? Doesn't matter whether other people are coming in legally or illegally. Doesn't matter whether they're college educated or high school dropouts. Doesn't matter whether some of them uh, are actual criminals. Doesn't matter if some of them are bringing in drugs. Doesn't matter about any of that. Hey, is, just let everybody in. There shouldn't be any borders. Except the people are, uh, in the countries around Venezuela are not quite as interested in that as the people on CNN are. Hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? So, I, you know, this country should just be extremely wealthy. But you look at what happened under Chavez. You look at what's happening under Maduro. And you look at what this government has done in stealing from the people. And stomping on their freedom and civil rights. And basically following a plan that Ocasio-Cortez would love to follow. Because Maduro is all about social justice. I mean, if you ever read any of his speeches, it's all about, you know, getting, getting the wealth of this country into the hands of the people and taking from these rich fat cats. Look what's happening. It's not just in Venezuela. It's what happens everywhere when they do this. Three million people have fled so far. Well, you know, it's just it's just because they're not doing it right. If they were doing it right, everything would be better. And Ocasio-Cortez and the Democrats are going to do it right. And if we could get one of them in as president and get them to have the House and the Senate, everything would be much better. I mean, see, I told you about that new Green Deal where we've got a majority of Americans in this poll saying that sounds good. And it makes you wonder who who are they polling? But it also makes you wonder what are we doing in teaching what the founding of this country was all about and what the American government is supposed to do and not do? Because it, we're not teaching it or we wouldn't have these responses. Because what we're doing right now is we have a majority of America that it sounds like, hey, if we're helping people, that sounds good. And they don't think about a couple things. Number one, hey, it sounds like it's going to help them, but you got to look at the unintended consequences and look at what really happens every time we try something like this and it never works out well. But actually, that should be number two. Number one should be, let me ask you something. Do you have a right to go into somebody else's house and take money and then go give it to someone else? Well, no, of course I don't have the right to do that. I'd be stealing. Then why is it any different here? Well, I mean, because it's taxes, because uh, it's what we're doing to share, share the wealth with people. Okay, so wait a second. So it, what you're saying is if you get enough people to agree with you, then it's okay to go into that person's house, steal their money, and give it to other people. No, no, I'm not saying that. Yes, you are. Look, we all understand that you need taxes to pay for the government you need. But the point was to have the smallest government you need. You know, just enough government to keep chaos from happening. I mean, they tried it with even less government with Articles of Confederation before we got to the Constitution that we live by now, or at least we're supposed to live by now, right? And and they said, okay, we want very, very little government. We want to leave it up to the states. And there was just problem between the states. You know, people were putting tariffs of if it came from this state to that state. And, and so he said, okay, we need a little bit more to hold everything together here. Certain things the federal government should do. And they're actually outlined in the United States Constitution. And that's all that's supposed to happen from the federal government. And the rest is supposed to remain with the states. And the states are supposed to have their constitutions that are supposed to keep it so that it's the smallest government possible. The least amount of intrusion in you. The least amount of taxes on you. Because we know that when you are taking from somebody against their will, you are stealing. It doesn't matter if a majority says it's okay. But all that's gone. All that's thrown out the window. Now it's just like, well, that sounds nice. And, you know, I'm not going to have to pay for it. So, you know, just tax the rich people. It just sounds good. It sounds so compassionate. And then we end up with cycles of poverty, cycles of welfare, cycles of drug dependency, cycles of poverty and crime. And we can't figure out why. And people that get more and more frustrated with the fact that more of their harder money is going to things that don't work. 
and can't figure out why we're having fewer and fewer entrepreneurs and fewer and fewer small businesses start. Oh, we're getting stuff online, but it's not what it used to be. Can't figure out why. What do you think? 844-DIG-CHAD, get you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD, and you're in. You got to hear the latest about tornadoes and a Major League Baseball story that will cheer you up. Got to hear this one. It's all coming up in just a minute. My name is Greg Knappin for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. Take a fake news break. Check, 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 check out the really important news of the day at our website, chadbensonshow.com. Once there, click on Chad's free podcast and get real. The Chad Benson Show, where truth and the American way live. Print free. Hey, how you doing? My name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. You can jump in at 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD, or the thechadshow.com. We were talking a lot about this new green deal, and one of the things they say, oh, it's going to help the environment. We're going to go 100% uh, renewable energies. Of course, we've got $2 a gallon gasoline. We're, at, we're a net exporter now of oil and natural gas, and we're, we've, we've still got coal for a couple hundred years. No, none of that. we got to go to this, that we have to subsidize. It's going to cost us out the wazoo, that really we don't have the capability to actually run everything we need to not enough energy being created that way but hey it's all about the environment because don't you understand this global warming it's about to kill the planet are you one of those deniers okay Um, i totally agree that our climate continues to change all the time and the problem is we don't have proof that we are the reason or how much we are contributing to it then you go a step beyond that of saying if so do we have any proof that we could actually do anything to reverse it? And you've even got people like Bjorn Lomberg, who is a guy that totally believes that humans are contributing to it, who says spending these trillions of dollars to try to reverse it won't do anything. And it would be much better to spend this money doing things like clean drinking water for the world. And you keep finding things like, hey, there was an 18-year cooling cycle that the Earth's been in where we haven't had any warming. We we had the the hide-the-decline problems where they were caught lying, the global warming propagandists. And guess what? Now we're getting, and and they're still lying about we've had, we've got more hurricanes and more intense hurricanes. No, we don't. No, we haven't. If you go actually look at the data, that's not true. But every time we have an intense one, they tell you it's because of global warming. And they have no proof of that. And yet when there's a lull, they tell you it has nothing to do with the fact that maybe we were wrong. And case in point, out of the Washington Post, 2018 will be the first year with no, quote, violent tornadoes, end quote, in the United States. They classify violent tornadoes as EF4s or EF5s. It's a zero to five scale for tornadoes. We've had no EF4 or EF5 touchdown this year. Now, wait a second. I thought we were supposed to have more tornadoes and stronger tornadoes. That's what we've been told. And in fact, we've been told that is what's been happening. Nope. 10 tornado deaths in 2018. That'll be a record low, too. The first time since the modern record began in 1950 to have no EF4s or EF5s touched down. And this year's goose egg may seem to fit a recent pattern. Wait, what? A recent pattern? Yes. There have been downtrends in violent tornado numbers across the entire modern period. And when looking at just the period since Doppler radar was fully implemented in the mid 90s, a 15 year average as high as 13.7 in the 70s will drop to 5.9 next year. Wait a second. I thought it was getting worse and there'd be more. Yeah, they've been lying to you. The global warming propagandists have been lying to you. And yet. Oh, oh, by the way, even the EF3s this year is poised to set a record for the least in the modern era. Nothing in this article about the global warming propagandists being wrong again. Wrong again. They've been wrong about how much the temperature was going to increase. They've been wrong about how much the the, the water levels were going to rise. They've been wrong about how much the ice is going to melt. They've been wrong about what's happening to the polar bears. They've been wrong, wrong, wrong. They can't even use their computer models to tell you what the temperature and the climate used to be. And yet, you're a denier for questioning all these lies. And that's why we need the New Green Deal. 
Major League Baseball player. Oh, we didn't have time to get into that. It's a great, great story on what he did with his signing bonus. Do a Google search on that one. You're going to love it. My name is Greg Knapp. In for Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show.